look forward to our future and to, to be able to have the schooling that we need and so many other things that we don't stop to thank you for all. Father, I pray especially for these young people right now as they are graduating and going on to the next phase in their life. Father, I pray that you would be with them. Father, I pray that they would honor you. I pray that they would be faithful to you. Father, I pray that they would remember all of the things that they have learned in school, but more importantly, Father, the things that they have learned from you, because their real future is in their eternity. So, Father, I lift each one of them up to you. I pray for their families. I thank you for their families' faithfulness as, as they went through their school. And so, today, Lord, we offer this time, and we pray for these young people. In the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. crumpled up when you get stepped on. Don't forget that. You're worth a lot. God loves you. You're worth a lot. Okay, I'm going to have Mr. Jeff come and pray for us. Here, Gage. Yes! And I have a dollar for each one of you after Mr. Jeff prays. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, we come to you today in prayer. We thank you so much for the youth. Lord, without the youth, we have nothing. This is our future. We ask that you would be with each and every one of these young people here, Lord. Let them lead them and guide them, Lord. Let them live a good life to honor you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ms. Connie. That was a great lesson. Well, while 
while the kids are getting their dollars, if y'all like to stand and join us, we're going to sing a few more songs. On this next one, I'd really like for y'all to put your hands together for me. It helps keep the rhythm if you could.
but I want to make sure we know about the faith. I was reading the other day about some people that went over to uh, a thor another foreign country, and they went to visit a monastery, which was a little bit different than most monasteries because it was built on the side of a cliff, and there was only one way to get up there. And that was, you had to get in the bottom, and you had to crawl into this little basket, and then a whole bunch of the monks that were up on top would haul you up to the top. And one of the missionaries that was there, as they were going up, he got to look at that, and the rope was pretty, flat, pretty frayed. And he got a little nervous, and he said, uh, how often do you change that rope? <laughs> and the monk says, when it breaks. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to have a lot of faith in a rope if you're going to be going up the side of a cliff. And this morning, I want to talk about some things about faithfulness. Now, there's a, a saying that especially a lot of the younger kids use that when you do something that's probably either not socially accepted or not accepted by them, they tell you, get a life. Yeah. Right? Anybody ever told you that, get a life? And so as I was reading the Psalms for this week, I thought to myself, what does that mean, get a life? Do you have a life? Now you have to think that through. Do you have a life? What does it mean when you, when you get a life? If you had a life, what would it feel like? What would it look like? And some of you are saying, well, I'm alive. But just because you're alive, do you have a life? You see, I think that these were the thoughts that maybe were going through David's mind when he penned this song. He was thinking, what is life really all about? And I believe that because of God's holiness and God's faithfulness, He not only showed David, He allowed David to put it down in writing and tell us what having a real life is all about. I want you to read, if you have your Bibles with you, in Psalms, chapter 62. If you don't, that's not a problem because I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 62. I'm going to begin with verse 5 because I believe David explains to us how to get a real life. Okay, Psalm 62, beginning with verse 5. It says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. Sounds like one of those songs, doesn't it? Just like Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken, my victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Amen. Oh, my people, trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. Amen. Right. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father and our God, we want to come to you today because you are our rock. You are our fortress. You are our refuge. You are our hope. Father, you are our creator. You are the one who provides for us. You are the one who sustains us. You alone are everything. And Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would use your words, not mine, but your words, that you would show us how to live the kind of life that you want us to live and how to have that eternal life with you that you want us to have. So we offer you this time, ask you and your spirit to take over this entire time. And we praise you because you can do this. In the name of Jesus our Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. I truly believe that God, well I know it's true because it says so in the Bible, that God used David to pen the words, and He wanted us to hear these words. And my prayer today is that each one of us would walk away with a better understanding of what our life, in God's eyes, 
should be or should have. He begins by saying, all that I am. Well, how many of us truly give all that I am over to God? Don't answer that. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Because I shouldn't be holding my hand up either. Because it's very difficult for us to give all that we are and all that we have over to God. But what God is saying by this when He gave these words to David is that our focus, our motivation, our desires in life is to be what God wants us to be. Yes, we have to make a living. Yes, we have to take care of our family. Yes, we have so many things that have to be done. And that's all great things. And it is wonderful to be a part of a world where we can do this. But right now, I want to talk about God's eyes. See, God does want you to have a life here. He wants you to have life and have it more abundant. He says that in His Word. And that is the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, it's true. That's all there is to it. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Amen. Or in some translations it says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundant. But see, in God's eyes, abundance doesn't necessarily mean things. In God's eyes, abundance means that you are perfectly comfortable, that you are happy. <coughs> That you are joyous because God is taking care of everything in your life. There may be problems going every which direction around you. You may feel like you're almost drowning in them, but if your life is in the hands of God, you don't have to worry about those little things that are going on around you because God is going to be the one that's taking care of them. Amen. As I think about the conversations that I've had for so long, and I've had people come to me and say, where was God when, when Josh had a car? Where was God when a little baby was stillborn? Where was God when the plague began to go? Where was God when the tsunami hit? Where was God? And I tell you, God was right where He was when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross. Because God is always there and God is always faithful. And you see, we can't comprehend the things of God. Right. There's no way. I could sit here all day long and try to give you some kind of theological explanation as to why those things happen, and it wouldn't take you any farther. But I do know one thing. God desires the best for you. He does. Amen. And sometimes, if it takes a disaster for God to give you the best, so be it. Because who are we to argue with God? <laughs> You see, when we lay it all on the line, we're giving ourselves over to God. And that means what? We are a witness for God. Do you realize in all of God's plan, which He knew His plan, since before the creation of man, what did God, what did God plan to spread the message of Jesus Christ throughout the world? He planned for you to do it. You are the witnesses. And He doesn't have a plan B. It's up to you. It's up to us. We're all witness. Now, what is witness mean? And Proverbs 12, 17 says, An honest witness tells the truth. A false witness tells lies. Hmm. You want to get a life? Then you better tell the truth. You want to get a great life? You want to be a person of honesty and integrity. Hmm. Proverbs 14, 5 says, An honest witness does not lie. A false lit witness breathes life. Now what are we talking about? The breath of life. If you want the breath of life in you that is controlled by the Spirit of God, then you need to breathe the truth and not lies. Right. Amen. <laughs> then Proverbs 14.25 says it more succinctly, a truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is a traitor. You see, we can be traitors to our country. We can be traitors to our family. We can be traitors to our friends. But see, when we are the people that breathe out the things of this world, that breathe out the lies and the mistrust and the schemes, then we are traitors to the kingdom of God. 
You want to get a life? Let it be a life of truthfulness, faithfulness, and honor. You see, because we are that witness for God. We can be good witnesses or we can be bad witnesses. And that's up to us. That's right. Remember what it said about John the Baptist? You know, John was the one who, who proclaimed and, and brought the, the message that Jesus Christ was coming. And what did it say in there? In John 8, John 1, 8 says, Jesus Himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. You're not supposed to be the light. You're supposed to be the one that the light shines in. You are a reflection Amen. of what God has done through Jesus That's Christ. Right. And you're supposed to reflect that That's to the right. world. Amen. Through your personal actions. You want a life? You want a Christian life? Act like a Christian. <laughs> Colossians 3.17 said, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father and through Him. Well, say in everything that you do. If you want to honor God, do things that God would want you to do and not do things that God doesn't want you to do. It's pretty simple, isn't it? You know, you used to say those little bracelets and some necklaces, you know, that just say WWJD, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you the truth, he wouldn't pay $17 for a neck for a bracelet. <laughs> Where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you see, Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. Now, does that mean that God is going to slap you down if you don't live a perfect sinless life? No. See, because Jesus was also a forgiving person. What did Jesus say when He was on the cross suffering and bleeding? What did He say? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did. Amen. There are some times that we are leading others into sin. Mm -hmm. And we don't know. But I have a news for you. Most of the time we really do know it. Yeah. Most of the time, if we're doing things wrong, if we're scheming and plotting against somebody else to get something just so that we can have something they don't have, that's sin. And that's leading others into sin because of our own actions. That's the point. If you want to have a life, live like Jesus Christ would want you to. Amen. I read a great quote. I can't even remember where it was the other day. It was just... Then I had to stop and I had to think about it and I had to look it over and I had to stop and I think about it again. And I want you to think about this quote that I read. It says, if the whole world were blind, how many people would you impress? Amen. If the whole world were blind, how many people <laughs> would know you were a Christian? <coughs> Because, see, being a Christian and living a Christ-like life is a whole lot more than having those bumper stickers on your car and the little fish on the back of your trunk and all of those kind of things. It is about living a life that you've given your all to Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. That's the life. Right. <laughs> it's about showing your gladness, your joy to the world. You know, there was a, a song that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I saw three people walk through that door this morning that from the looks of their face, they weren't real glad to be here. <laughs> but only three. That's just a kid. Just kidding, okay? <laughs> what I'm saying is that we need to show others our gladness, our joy. Because see, when we come to church, we need to come with a joyful heart, being joyful and grateful and thankful to God for what He's already done for us Amen. and being grateful that we have the opportunity to share Jesus Amen. with someone else around us. That's right. That's our job. Preach it, brother. Amen. You know, <laughs> contrary to public opinion, it is not my job to save people. I can't. That's right. It is not my job to go out into the highways and the byways and bring people into the church. That's all of our jobs. 
Every one of us. That's our jobs. So when we have people walk into the door of the church, how can we tell them that we are glad if we are not? And how can we be glad about coming to a worship service when we haven't prepared our heart beforehand to come into the presence of God in the name of Jesus Christ and worshiping together and be glad and be joyous? That's when we, ahead of time, we have prayed, we have honored God, and we are coming in, and then we can truthfully say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The second thing that David penned there was about waiting. Waiting on God's timing. <laughs> waiting quietly before God. You know, in our studies in the last few weeks, we've been studying and we talked about a fortress. The fortress where people would go and, and, and be there in case there was an attack on their, on their city or their land. A fortress is a place of, of protection. But you know what? A fortress is not good to anybody unless they're inside it. Yeah. That's right. You have to think about that. A fortress doesn't do you any good if you're on the outside. And that's the way it is. The kingdom of God doesn't do you a lot of good unless you are inside the kingdom of God. And there's only one way into the kingdom of God, and that's a little key called Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's right. Jesus. Yes, right into the kingdom of God. But see, when we're kingdom citizens, then we need to act like a kingdom citizen. That's what he's telling us. And we need to wait for God's timing. <laughs> you know, there's a part of me, this side of my brain, that likes to wake up in the morning and think, oh, Jesus, come today. Oh, Jesus, just come today, and let's just get all of these worries out of the way. Let us be in heaven for eternity. Let us never worry about anything. Just, Jesus, just come today. Because I'm supposed to be excited about it. That's what it says in there. Jesus, just come today. But then the other part of my brain says, look at my friends and look at my relatives and look at so many people that do not know Jesus Christ and they haven't found the key into the kingdom of heaven. Right. Amen. So the only alternative, if Jesus doesn't come today, I need to live my life and show people the glory of God as it reflects off of me and it changes my actions and my motivations and my desires about everything in my life. Yes, I want to get a life. And it's a life in Jesus Christ. Sometimes, myself included, I think we just get a little weary and tired rushing around trying to do all the good things. And I'm not saying go out and do bad things. What I'm saying is that there's a lot of good things that we can do, but if it's not God's timing in your life right now, then you may be just rushing around, making yourself tired. That's right. Amen. And not accomplishing anything. Because if we ever really want to accomplish anything, it has to be through the leadership and the guidance of Jesus Christ. How do we find that leadership and that guidance? It's right here. It's right here in the Word. <laughs> Remember when the Pharisees asked Jesus about the greatest commandment? And they thought they were going to trick him. Because whatever he said, they thought that they could trick him and make him be wrong. But you know what he said? What Jesus said when they asked him about the greatest commandment, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with your mind. And the second, just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. How much different would the kingdom of God be if every citizen of the kingdom of God truly loved your neighbor as yourself? Uh huh. That's right. <clears throat> I was reading another article this morning that talked about somebody that had been. noticed that he was living in a sinful manner. And the article, in fact, was the fact that we probably can't argue them out of that. But we can live a life in such a manner that they can see that we have something they don't. And what they can see is that we have a life of joy, peace, and contentment, and patience, 
and all of those things that they need. I'm telling you, as I watch some of these superstars on the television, and I notice that most of them have a problem. They either are going to get drunk or get in trouble. They're going to take the drugs and get in trouble. They're going to live a lifestyle that gets them in trouble. And I want to tell them, you really should get a life. And I'm telling you what they show on TV about the life of the rich and the super and the famous and all of that, that's not a real life. If you've got a life, you're content with what you have. Right. Amen. If you're not feeling content with what you have, then you need to pray and wait for the Lord to give it to you. It's not something you can just reach up there on the shelf and grab down and say, I want to be content. <coughs> God wants you to have it. <laughs> Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait patiently on the Lord. Be brave and courageous. <coughs> Yet, yeah, wait patiently on the Lord. If you've got a sister or a brother or a mother or a father, and you want to, and you really desire them to be in the kingdom of God. It doesn't do you a lot of good to go out and reach out and grab them around the neck and drag them and try and say, "Come into the kingdom of God." Wait patiently as you pray, as you as you pray. Wait patiently as you lead a life, and let God do the winning. You just do the witnessing. Psalm 62 5 said, Let all that I am wait quietly before God because my hope is in Him. Amen. If your hope is truly in God and you understand that God is our Creator, God is the one who sustains us, God is the one who provides for us, and your hope is truly in Him, then you don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry if you have a, a new Mercedes Benz in the driveway. If you don't have one, you don't have to insure it. Amen. <laughs> you don't have to worry if you have something that your neighbor has. You see, because our concern is for our real future. In this world, we might have five years, ten years, hundred years. But how long is eternity? How long is eternity? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what, I am a human being and it is impossible for me to even imagine eternity. See, because from the time I was a little bitty kid, that was my beginning, I have known that I had a beginning and I have an end. But see, eternity has no end. It had no beginning. We cannot comprehend that. We are, we can't comprehend that. But yet, when we live a life of hope and faith, then God gives us all that we need to say, I can't understand it, but I am excited about it. Amen. I am living for it. And I'm going to live my life because that future eternity is a whole lot more important than the things that happen right here. That's right, brother. brother. Amen. The third thing that I think David tells us is to watch. You see, we have to watch and recognize who God is. He talks about God. He says, that's my rock. He's my salvation. It's my fortress. It's my victory and my honor and my refuge. All of those are great descriptions about God. And it tells us, where do I put my trust? And there's not a nameplate on heaven's door that says Chase Manhattan Bank. <laughs> where do I put my, where is my rock? Where is my salvation? Where is my true fortress? And there's only one true fortress, and that's God in heaven. Last week we had a little picture up there about Fort Knox. How many, how many of you truly believe that Fort Knox is impenetrable? Not a soul. How many of you believe that there is an army in this world that's invincible? Not a soul. 
But I'm telling you right now, when you put your treasures in the hand of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that is impenetrable. There is not an a, a army in the world and never has been and never will be that can take that right out of there. Amen. That's the hand of God. Right. Watch for Him. Know what He is. Watch for God as you listen for His guidance in your life. In your life. Watch for God as you confess to Him when you have failed Him. You know, David has a quote in the psalm and, and when he's talking about his sinfulness and he told God, he's confessing to God, but he said, against you and you only have I sinned. That doesn't mean that he didn't sin against uh, Uriah. Bathsheba's husband. That doesn't mean he didn't sin against him. But what he's talking about is if I'm going to be a, a citizen of the kingdom of God, then I need to be really careful about sinning against God. That's what David says. Watch for what it is that's in your life that's keeping you from having a real life. You know, I know a lot of people that have great professions and they make a lot of money. And the problem is so many times they're making such good money that all of a sudden they begin to depend upon that lifestyle and they kind of forget about God that brought them there in the first place. <coughs> wow. You want to have a good life? Psalms chapter 86. You can look it up if you want to. Psalms chapter 86. If you want to have a good life, I want you to, I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. And it just, it's, it's all of this together. It's the Reader's Digest of version of how to have a good life, a great life. It says, Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart so they may honor you with all my heart. I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give you glory to your name forever, for your love for me is so great. You have rescued me from the depths Amen. of the ocean. He did. Amen. So my question for you today, for you to think about, maybe even right now, has God rescued you from the depths of the ocean? You see, we live in a world where everything seems to be pointing us away from God. We live in a society where they're trying to push God out the door. But it's not anything new. It's been happening for years and years and years. So my question is, is that because the world is so mired in this kind of stuff, has God rescued you from the depths of the ocean? We're going to have a time of invitation. The invitation is simple. See, because it, it doesn't come from me. It comes from the Word of God. The invitation is just what God says. Come. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my ways are easy. That's my translation. My ways are easy and my burdens are light. Come to me and let me take your burdens. And you just carry the burdens. You want to have a good life? Come unto God. And you know what Jesus Christ Himself said? Jesus, the Savior of the world, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Right. If you have not come to the Father in heaven by any means whatsoever other than Jesus the Christ, you are not in the kingdom of God. That's where you have a real life. If you have never done that, I want you to think about it as we are having a time of invitation because I am inviting you not to do what I would want you to do, not to do what anybody else would want you to do. I am inviting you to do and allow God to work through His words. His words. You want to be certain about your future. Put it in the hands of the one who would never fail.